Aloha. Um, thank you guys all for coming, uh, or not coming, uh, viewing our second um, pre-recorded Zoom um, presentation. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have Susan Scott again, once again. Um, but today she'll be talking about the Great Barrier Reef and how great it, it's still great. So uh, without further ado, Susan. Thank you, Gavin. Well, I'm back. Uh, I am uh, representing the Hawaii Audubon Society. And since we thought these presentations were going to be canceled, um, my, my colleague uh, and friend John Harrison wasn't able to do his talk today. So I wanted to share with you the, uh, my experience of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia because I'm supposed to be there right now. I was going to leave uh, last week couple weeks ago actually and we talked a lot about still going and then the whole pandemic came and all the airlines canceled and so that wasn't up to us to go but I want to tell you my experience with the Great Barrier Reef and one of the reasons that I think it's still great. So uh, the Great Barrier Reef is a World Heritage Area and Marine Park this is one of the signs in one of the islands. The headlines we hear are all bad news. That's the state of news generally. And one of them uh, was in 2016 and up till now is that half of all the uh, coral in the barrier reef has died. Another headline said that 93% of the barrier reef is practically dead. And this really upset a lot of Australians because it's the obituary and said the Great Barrier Reef uh, of Australia passed away in 2016 after a long illness. It was 25 million years old. And this was Outside Magazine and really upset people in Australia because it is not totally dead. Uh, one of the problems is there's so many different reefs, uh, separate reefs on the barrier reef that the, the studies are only showing part of the, part of the barrier reef that um, the, the people are actually studying. So there's other places that, that still look fine. Uh, the interesting thing is I looked at Breitbart News when I was putting this together and it says uh, that this is classic fake news. Like the thriving polar bear, the recovering ice caps, and the doing just fine Pacific Islands, the Great Barrier Reef has become a totem for the liberal left. Not because it's in any kind of danger, because it's big and famous and photogenic. And, and so there's lots of different, really amazing different takes on what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef, but this is, this is nonsense because it, it does have some problems. It's not, it's not by any means uh, in perfect shape, but um, it's not fake news either. So the reason I wanna tell you about it is because I sailed there. I sailed my uh, sailboat with a friend in 2006 from the LOI Boat Harbor. And we sailed through uh, to, uh, to Tahiti and then across to Australia, and I spent some time there. Uh, then we shipped the boat, just so you know, back to uh, Mexico, where I spent several years on the uh, Sea of Cortez. And then my husband, Craig, flew there, and we sailed back to Australia because it, having been across the Pacific and through the Hawaiian Islands, it is really one of the most amazing places to have a boat. So that's where the boat is now, and that's why I was going to fly there again, going a couple times a year to visit the boat and have the boat take us to amazing places. So the Great Barrier Reef has uh, is 3,000 separate coral reefs, and that's one of the issues is these reports come from different sections of the reef. Uh, it's, a, as I said, a World Heritage Area, and even though there's 3,000 reefs, it makes up only about 10% of the area that's considered the Great Barrier Reef National Park. Uh, this shows you a little bit about the uh, all the islands that are, and and the reef. It goes from uh, Australia's opposite of us. The warmest part is in the north because the equator is north there, and then the cooler parts are down here. So the most of the lot of the damage is up in the north, and the central parts middle, and the southern parts better because the water's cool. So between the mainland where uh, Honu is moored in a marina. And the outside of the outer reefs is what they call the outer reefs is 35 and 155 miles wide. So you don't just go out there in a day casually. There's lots of challenges. It takes Honu seven to 31 hours. So we have to plan it. And we also have to really, really watch the weather. 
The challenges are there's big currents because there's water going, tidal uh, streams going in and out of the reefs. And so that makes uh, navigating uh, difficult, even with GPS, even though you know there's currents, you still have to get through them in a, in a 37 foot sailboat, which averages five miles an hour. And when you get to the reefs, this is what you see. You don't see, the, and you don't see much, you just see a change in water color. And that means you're there. And so that, that uh, is it requires its own navigation challenges because you need good sunlight to have this kind of, this kind of picture. Uh, this is from the top of one of the islands. So you can see this is one of the reefs. It's got a little bit of a, um, a spit, a little island, sand island on the left side here that sometimes is covered with water at high tide and sometimes not. And sometimes these are always exposed and um, it just makes exploring these little reefs really, really amazing. So when you get out there, uh, you can see that under, just barely under the water is an amazing scene. And this is uh, just a few feet of water. And one of the things that you see when you're out in there is that you are out in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't look like there's much of anything. And it has to be calm water because there's no protection when you're, when you're on the outer reefs. So you have to watch the weather pretty carefully. And if the weather, wind starts coming up, it comes out from the open ocean with no protection to the boat. And that has happened to us a couple of times, 2 a.m. you're up getting up that anchor and getting out of there. But you have to be very careful because of the, the reefs you can't see at night. So there's, there's all kinds of issues. And I, and I wanna say one thing, people have asked me often, how to get out here to see the reef. There are tour boats, but you really need your own boat because you, you can't judge the weather on a vacation. You know, if you take a trip there and you go out on a, on a tour boat, you can maybe, if you're lucky, get to see some of this. But it's one of the reasons we have left the boat there uh, because it, it's our vehicle to get out here to this amazing place. And it is an amazing place. So this is anchored. There's squid comes right up to the boat. It's out for, protected out there, it's really amazing. And this is from the dinghy. Uh, we launch a dinghy and then uh, usually drag it with us because of the current. And then when you get tired, you can just hop in the dinghy and load it back to the boat. So this is some of the scenes of, of what you see out there and really it's eye popping. I, I had a problem making this slideshow because I have so many pictures of just unbelievable coral. And there's 800, let's see, 400 species of coral on the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, as comparison, Hawaii has 80. So even though our reefs are gorgeous, this, this is really an amazing site. And these are just some of the pictures that I chose because it's, the colors are just eye popping when you're snorkeling along. I can hardly get anywhere because I keep having to stop to see the, the check out the coral. And this, this is not a bleached coral, it's just a really light colored pale uh, blue. And this is a soft coral, one of my favorites. Uh, it doesn't have a common name, so I nicknamed the pom pom coral because it sometimes glows in little round clumps and it's, it sways in the current. Uh, and this is called a rubber coral. That's like this, this reminds me of the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man because it looks like those big puffy marshmallows. But this is the coral, a soft coral that's closed up. And as it starts to open, it changes appearance completely. And this is it a little open and that's completely open. So that and the first picture is the same coral, but it just depends what time you get there. So it's constantly changing besides being just really beautiful colors. Uh, this is a soft coral that's sort of in transition. And I, I put this in just to show this is, if you're snorkeling by and you see this, it looks completely different than this one that's all, all the uh, polyps are pulled in. So they open up the feed and then go back in. Of course, the fish, are different from what we have here in Hawaii. Some of the same, but a lot of them, for me, it was really exciting uh, as a person who really loves marine biology to, to see these fish, get pictures, and then look them up when they get back to the boat. So that was a butterfly fish. This is called uh, uh, Baramundi, a reef Baramundi. Really weird looking, gorgeous fish. Husk fish, another kind of uh, butterfly fish that uh, it's really fun to take pictures, even if they're not great, I can bring them back and, and look at up, uh, several books on the boat. And I can look up things. And of course, there's almost every kind of uh, clownfish and anemones out there. This was a big black 
uh, Ulua that was under the boat when we came back. And you don't see that very often here in Hawaii. It's really enormous. Of course, there's invertebrates galore. I also had to just choose a few pictures, but uh, there's almost no end of this is a crinoid. That was, of course, a starfish. And the colors were amazing. So one of the things that we do when we're there, uh, the, the Barrier Reef has 900 islands inside those outer reefs. And so the islands are a place that you can sail to and shelter there and wait for the calm weather to get out to the outside. But even if you don't have good weather, you can stay at the islands because they're part of the, the marine park and they're just amazing. And we have been to almost all of these islands. This is just a picture of a few of them uh, of the 600, but, but it's, it's a, the islands are astonishing. And this is what it looks like when you're approaching one of the islands. It doesn't look like much, but it's pretty amazing when you get up close. And as you can see, you have to be careful where you, how you approach the island. This is really well charted on GPS charts, the barrier reef. We've only been in two places that we found an island or a reef that was not on the chart. So you still have to pay attention, but mostly it's on. And in this case, of course, we went around to the other side to get close to this island. Uh, I just wanted to show this picture because this is just one island that we were on and we could see about 10 others. And so there's just unlimited places to go. You can climb up to the tops of some of the islands. Uh, some of them are uh, part, used to be part of the mainland and then the sea level rose. So there's still some really high ones. And you can see there's a runway here. So some are inhabited, but mostly are not inhabited by humans, but they're inhabited by uh, lots of other creatures. So this island was completely full of turtle nests. These are green sea turtles. And we didn't go on it. Once we got up there and saw all the turtle tracks and some of the turtle nests, we, we did not walk on these islands. I just showed some of the gorgeous places. This is an inlet on Whitsunday Island. And to show you some scale on this, uh, th these are people walking there. So when the tide's out, it's an entirely different experience than when the tide's in. You have much higher tides than here, depending on what part of the reef you're at. But the, the tidal ranges make really interesting sailing, one of which you can get stranded if you bring your dinghy into the island to the shore. And this is Craig uh, walking the dinghy back a long, long ways because we were in for a long time. The tide went out and then we, we couldn't put the motor in. So um, another interesting part of the tidal range there is when the tide's high, there's lots of rays that come in and feed on the sands. And so they, they dig they wiggle holes into the sand, and then you can see the outline of the reefs, uh, of the, excuse me, the rays, and sometimes you can even, even see the tail as they get way down in the sand. And this is one of the larger ray pits. So as you're walking along, you can see where the rays were, and it's in a, some of them are really enormous. We have actually seen rays this size uh, while snorkeling, but we don't get close to them because of the accident that Steve Irwin had. They're not out to get you by any means, but they, they really can be startled uh, if you surprise them. And so when you see rays, they really big, we stay away. This is from the top of uh, Lizard Island, which is a fa famous island at the northern part of the Barrier Reef. And it was uh, famous, Captain Cook was there and named it. And Honu is right here. And it's in uh, uh, marine biology research station. So I got to talk to the researchers and spend some time there. The reason it's called Lizard Island, named by Captain Cook, was because it's full of really big lizards. They're friendly, they're not harmful, but they really get your attention. This one's going up a path that people walk on, just to give you an idea of the size. And they're very curious, they're not afraid of people. And this one is tasting my toes, <laughs> I'd say. Yeah, it was in a campground, so the lizard was used to people, but it was really hard to stand perfectly still and get my camera out of my pocket and take the picture because I know that it's, this is just its tongue and it's just tasting me with its tongue, smelling mostly, but uh, it was still hard to stand still. But I, I'm really proud of the pictures. So. Uh, the other great thing about visiting the islands, and one of the reasons that we've been to these islands many times where we just don't get out to the reef because of the weather, but it doesn't really matter because the islands are so full of wildlife. And this is um, fruit bats on one of the islands. They are very charming creatures. 
There's a couple species. Lizard Island had the black uh, fruit flying foxes is what they call them, another name. And there's a baby clinging to the mom on this one. And the other one is closed up its wing over its belly because they, they get shy if you point a camera at them for too long. One of the things I really like that people don't talk too much about is the green ants. And they're on most of the islands. Uh, Lizard Island had some along a walking path. So I, I watched these ants for a while. And what they do is they build bridges from one leaf to another with their own bodies. So, so down here, these, these are climbing on top of each other and they're gonna connect to the side. These ones have already, uh, are already done it because the white stuff on the edge is the saliva, this ant spit that they uh, secrete to pull the leaves together because they make nests out of leaves and then they lay their eggs inside and they have larvae. And so this is quite an activity to watch. And when it's done, when the nest is mature, it's just a, a beautiful piece of art, really. So all the white stuff is secreted by the ants and the eggs and larvae are inside. And uh, as the leaves die because they are folded in and they can't do photosynthesis anymore. And when the larvae hatch and the babies leave, the nest dies and then the adults get to it again. So it's quite an amazing experience to stand and watch these ants making bridges. These are making some bridges over here. Their bodies just sort of hold on to each other and make um, amazing bridges. So they also bite. So one time I touched one of the, these uh, construction sites and they sent their soldier ants down the trunk of the tree to bite my feet. And so, and it happened fast. So I, I never touched them again, but as long as you keep your hands off them, they're, they're fine. The other thing that's happened a couple of times is uh, this is a sulfur crested cockatoo and it came from a flock. You can see part of the flock back here and it saw the boat and it landed on the boat. They're very brave, bold parrots. And this one, we wondered what it was doing, what it was thinking. And what it was thinking was it saw us eating potato chips in the cockpit here. And it really wanted them. And clearly it knew boats. And so it came down, we backed off and it jumped down, got some potato chips, and then it, it ate its fill. And it was very good for it. But the second time it came, when we anchored there, uh, another time we gave it uh, cashews. And we had a little dish of cashews that we called uh, cockatoo food. And then it was, went up onto the uh, Bimini awning and then uh, said goodbye and took off back to its flock. So I don't know if this bird had been tamed in the past or not, but I, I don't think so. I think they're just that um, uh, tamed to, to humans and used to humans. Of course, there's birds everywhere on these islands. These are uh, noddies and uh, terns that were on one of the islands. Here they are all standing around. And one of the species that's really common that sometimes land on the boat are called crested terns. And they always have a bad hair day. They always look like this. They're really uh, funny birds. And they have their wings lowered like that, uh, and that because that's how they cool off. It was really a hot day. And uh, on the left here is one of their chicks. So that's roped off in the picture before this. There's a rope around the area where the nesting is and that's off limits to people. There's birds on all the islands. These are called um, stone curlews that are fairly common and they make a really eerie moaning sound, a little like our wedge-tailed shearwaters. And uh, these are called silver gulls which we jokingly call sterling because they're just so amazing and brilliant. The sun is shining just right on these are on the pulpit of the boat and they tend to hang out and squabble over who gets to stand on the front of the boat. One of the other great things about leaving the boat in Australia is that the marinas there uh, are on the mainland. She's in a marina in, in Townsville about the central reef, but the marinas are just as much fun as the islands and the outer reef. So here's a family of kangaroos that was in the storage area of the marina we were in. And there's herons on the, this is walking along a finger pier and he's displaying because there was another heron on the other end who was in his territory. So he's uh, kind of scared away. And then both of them jumped onto the boat next to me and gave me a stink eye here. So I, I really love the, the boat. The, birds in the marinas. There's uh, 
ibises in the marinas and galahs, which are kind of parrot just hanging out. So walking around is, is uh, on the ground is just as much fun as being in the water. These are one of our favorites. There's a little cafe in the marina and these are called uh, blue face honey eaters. And what they, they're they also bold and they have learned to eat. They like sugar and they like milk, amazingly. So when someone has a latte, they wait after the person leaves and they drink the last of the latte in the bottom of the cups. And they do this fairly regularly. Then they steal the sugar packets because they know there's sugar in there. And they take them to the water's edge and they beat them on rocks and get the, the package wet until they break open and then they eat the sugar. So people, the restaurant owners don't really want them to steal the sugar, they don't really care about drinking. You can see there's some, some foam left in the cups and that's what the uh, birds really like. And so they let them steal one or two and then they bring them in. But we, we were very entertained by this. And um, the birds in the marina, uh, this is an anhinga that was on top of our mast. And here it is in the water. They're also called snake birds because they sit so low in the water that their, their neck and beak remind people of snakes. They're not snakes. And then here it is on the uh, finger pier near our boat, drying its wings after it's been fishing. These are um, cormorants on the navigation buoys. And the pelicans there are the biggest in the world. They're standing on light posts here, and here's one just walking around in the marina. They're enormous, gorgeous birds. One of the smaller birds are called welcome swallows. And when you bring your boat into a uh, channel, usually they land on the lifelines when, they, when you first come in, and they're very friendly. But you don't want to see two. If you do see two, you don't want them to hang around because I said, Craig, look, there's a, a welcome swallow on the neighbor's boat in one of the fittings. And it turned out it was not a fitting, it was a nest. And they build nests in all kinds of places on the boat. And the problem with this is they lay eggs and if they have hatch, you, you wanna get them before they hatch because you don't wanna have to kill the babies, but you can't really go sailing with little chicks on the, you know, different places. A lot of times they get under the sail covers. And so I'm always on the patrol if they see them coming to the boat and they've got sticks in their beaks, they're gonna build a nest. So one of the things I wanted to talk about the coral reef is they are always under pressure to, uh, for, for territory in the sun. These are called Christmas tree worms. They, they always come in pairs. They're boring worms, they bore into the coral. And so they come in lots of beautiful colors. And these are their little curriculums that cover them. When you startle them, they, uh, dash back into their tunnel and then the, the curriculum covers them. But you can see there's, they've done some damage to the coral and the coral there is always under assault by other plants and animals because they all want to live in the sunlight. And so this, these are parrotfish uh, stars that the parrotfish have eaten parts of the live polyps on this uh, living coral. And the other one is boring clams. They're not, they're not boring as in not interesting, but they're boring as in drilling into the coral heads. And this is going on all over the barrier reef. So you see these gorgeous clams, but occasionally the clams get the better of the coral head. And these have really done a job on this coral head. And eventually, um, these are called micro atolls because they're, they're just coral around the edges and animals on the inside. And so they pretty much got the best of this uh, coral head. Animals also, other animals drill in. These are tunicates called sea squirts that are damaging the coral uh, polyps here. And then the soft cor corals are also in competition with each other. So this is one of the, the marshmallow corals and these are one of my pom-pom corals. But they're all, they're, when you look at all these, they're always trying to grow over each other. And there's this constant war going on of one coral putting out tentacles to fight off the neighbor. So this is a lavender coral growing over this one, clearly killing it. And these were tiny little uh, corals of a different species, species on this species. And when you bat, I backed off and looked at it, they were winning. They, they had actually crept in this much onto killing this coral underneath it. So this is a natural phenomenon. Eventually the algae gets into it 
And when that comes in, then the fish eat the algae and it's, it's a big uh, ecosystem of constant change. So the crown of thorns has always been an issue. Uh, we all know about the crowns of thorns. They are a natural part of the reef. What they do is uh, they eat coral and that's normal when there's just one or two uh, in an area. And then that uh, opens up an area for new corals to recruit. So they're well named because the crown of thorns, they do have uh, very pokey uh, spines and they have toxin in them, which really hurts. Uh, they have yellow tube feet. So you can see the, uh, that's how they walk around. And this one is devouring a, a piece of coral. And then it opened uh, that or something else opened up this coral for another species to grow. And so I like this one, it looks like an elephant. But uh, that's the job of the, of the crown of thorn starfish is to, um, is to open up the, the reef for diversity, to keep it diverse. What happens though is they have uh, this uh, growth, uh, abnormal growth where they just pile on top of each other. They're just everywhere in some parts of the reef. And they're, they're, you can see they've moved. This part's all eaten and bleached and they're heading this way and eventually they will have eaten this whole, uh, this whole table coral. Now the barrier reef has natural destruction. This was a hurricane that uh, had happened six months before Craig and I were there. We read about it. We heard about this terrible destruction in the Whitsundays where we like to sail. And you can see it really, really did a job on the reef. But in six months, we took a hike through one of the trails and this was already happening. So this goes on. Also, the weather is a, is a destroyer and then the re of the reef and then it, it comes back fairly quickly. This was a, a really nice to see, very heartening. So the, the, put this in, so to show you the central part, there's, there's central where we are, we here are here in Townsville, sort of the middle of the central, the southern part of the reef's doing better and the northern part is doing poorly because that's where the water is the warmest. Uh, one heartening thing, I have a book on the, on the boat called The Reef, written by a man who studied it all of his uh, professional career, 50 some years, and he described coral reefs that were inland in Australia. He described one about 100 miles inland from our marina. So we rented a car and drove in there, and I wanted to see this because it really made me feel better. It made me feel better to read it on the, on, in the book, but also we found the reef. And this is 100 miles inland. It's 360 million years old. Uh, and it was the second mass extinction where 80 to 95% of all the marine species went extinct. And Verone, who's uh, Charlie Verone, who wrote the book, said these species did not, um, there weren't just, just some larvae left of these species. These species re evolved. And so that gives you hope that if the reef does die, that it, if we are in the sixth extinction, which we may be in the in the middle of it or the beginning of it, that the animals will re-evolve and come back. It may take millions of years, but uh, Craig, that's my toe on the right here. <laughs> Craig carried this piece home for me because I was so happy to see this. It just gave me some hope that we, I'll look at the small picture, but there's an enormous picture that it's hard for us to see. So the Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, this was from 18, 2018, showed signs of recovery after the bleaching. But the bad news was this was yesterday when I was preparing this, I looked again at the literature. This was in the New York Times yesterday, and I found it in several other uh, online newspapers that it's bleaching again. They just had a, a very warm summer. They're heading into winter now. And so we don't really know what's gonna happen. Um, the global warming is the issue in our, in, in our lifetimes. And so we know that the US is out, pulled out of the Paris climate and the Australians are, uh, one of their main industries is coal. And so there's a lots of resistance to stop mining for coal and we, we know all the politics. There's a lot of politics going on with the barrier reef just like there is here in the US about global warming. So the boat is still there. And one of the dilemmas we have is, you know, it takes months to sail. You don't just sail there and back. We fly there twice a year. So we contribute to the global warming. Like everybody else who flies, 
but we really want to have the boat there so we can see the, 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 what's still left of the barrier reef, the central part where we are is still pretty nice. So there's lots of, lots of questions, but I think for me right now, uh, I hope when this is over, when this pandemic's over, we can all fly again and maybe they'll have made some changes, but when we were there, this is a Pisonia forest, a native Pisonia forest, which is which just glorious on one of the islands that's still there and there's not too many of these left. And uh, it just made me so happy to be in it that um, I'd be really happy to come back. So I know you can't ask me questions, but you can contact me at my website, which is susanscott.net. And there's a contact page on there to email me and I will, promise I will answer. I try to answer all the email questions. And then you can also look at the uh, Kalea account site, kaleaaccount.org. Uh, and that is all sponsored by the Hawaii Audubon Society. We're trying to get an idea of how many Kalea we have. And there's a contact on there and those come directly to me, those questions. So please feel free to question. I miss seeing all your smiling faces and talking, but we'll get back to that soon. And thanks for viewing.